This video is supported by Brilliant.org. Imagine you're a merchant in the ancient Parthian Empire, and you got your hand full of stuff. You got like a jar full of vinegar, you got a copper tube, you got an iron rod, some other things, and you need a free hand, so you like paint the iron rod inside of the copper tube, put both of them inside the jar of vinegar, grab your stuff, and then head out to make some deliveries. And at one of the stops, you put your jug up on the counter, and while you're haggling with the customer, you put your hand on top of the jug, and you feel a little, uh, a little tingle, a little shock there. What was that? That scenario, or something very close to it, was probably the origin of the Baghdad Battery. I've talked about that before on this channel, but the Baghdad Battery is one of the most mysterious archaeological finds of all time. We actually don't even know exactly when and where it was found, only that it wound up in the possession of German archaeologist Wilhelm Koenig sometime in the 1930s. He claimed it was found near the site of the ancient city of Kubut Rajua in modern-day Iraq, and yeah, it was basically a jug that had on the inside of it a copper tube and an iron rod that was very deteriorated at that point, and the inside of the jug had an acidic resin in it. And Koenig surmised that this was some kind of primitive ancient battery, because all the elements were there. Just a quick battery 101, just so we're all on the same page here. A battery is basically three components, an anode, a cathode, and an electrolyte of some kind. The electrolyte chemically transports positive ions from the anode to the cathode, which frees up electrons. The electrons then travel through an external circuit, which creates electricity that powers your devices. This is where I'm obligated to acknowledge that yes, in some batteries, the anode and the cathode are flipped in terms of charges. I know that because only about a thousand of you told me in the last video I made about batteries, so there you go. Are you happy? Congratulations. And you know what? One more thing, you sons of b So that's how batteries work, and uh, that's exactly what was in the Baghdad battery, apparently. Now, of course, this has sparked all kinds of crazy theories about ancient aliens and time travelers in Atlantis to try to explain how people in the year 300 AD would have access to this kind of advanced technology. Now, slightly less crazy is the idea that they may have used these batteries to do some kind of electroplating uh, by stringing several of these together, which they would have to string many of these together because according to Mythbusters, they recreated one of these things. They only got one or two volts out of it. The thing was, if that was the case, you would have found dozens, maybe hundreds of these things out there being used, and that isn't the case, so that's pretty unlikely. Most likely is that this was used in some kind of religious ritual, because those one or two volts would be just enough to create a little bit of a tingle, you know, just a little bit of a sensation that's unexplainable, weird, maybe mystical, or maybe it was just a novelty thing, like they just put this together and they found out that it made this weird feeling and it just became something of a, a toy. Whatever they used it for, these ancient tinkerers stumbled on a technology that wouldn't be rediscovered again for 1,400 years with the Leyden Jar in 1745. This was about the time that they started to discover this whole electricity thing, you know, Ben Franklin and his kite and all that, and the Leyden Jar was the first time they were able to actually store this kind of energy. About 100 years later, we actually started using this electricity in our factories and our communications and whatnot, and this led to the first commercially available battery, a lead sulfuric acid battery, in 1859. It was invented by French physicist Gaston Planté, and it kicked off a whole new era of battery technology. Uh, many of you may know that the, some of the very first cars out there were actually electric cars that were run off of this battery. The next era probably belongs to Thomas Edison and his popularizing of the iron-nickel battery, which became the gold standard after 1908. And from there, engineers would continue to iterate on the battery, increasing the energy density with different types of cathodes and anodes, different electrolytes over time. But the next big game changer was the lithium ion battery that was invented in 1978. This made cell phones possible, laptops, digital cameras, and basically whatever you're watching this on. The lithium ion battery has arguably made our entire way of life possible. But we may be on the verge of a new breakthrough, one that might make an entirely new way of life possible, with a new game changer. Brought to you by the same guy who created the last one. About a month or so ago, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was announced, and it went to a trio of researchers whose combined work made the lithium-ion battery possible, and one of those guys was John B. Goodenough, who became the oldest recipient of the award at 97 years old. By the way, quick plug, I did talk about this on the Our Ludicrous Future podcast, in case you don't know what that is, it's a podcast that I do with Ben Solins and Tim Dodd, and it's kind of the place where I talk about breaking news stories and stuff, that's not really something I can do uh, very well on this channel, but I do it there. Uh, if you're interested, I'll put a link up there, I'll put a link down in the description, definitely go check it out. Okay, end of the shameless plug. Getting back to the subject at hand, there are two types of people in this world. People who hear the name John B. Goodenough and then say, wait, what? John B. Goodenough? Are you kidding? That's his name? That's his real name? John B. Goodenough. And people who hear the name John B. Goodenough and say, Dude. Legend. 
Because it's really not too much hyperbole to argue that John B. Goodenough is almost single-handedly responsible for our entire way of life today. In the 1980s, Goodenough used the research done by M. Stanley Whittingham on battery materials and realized that lithium cobaltite oxides could be used as a lightweight, high-energy density cathode, basically doubling the capacity of lithium-ion batteries. This discovery is basically what popularized the lithium-ion battery and made it what it is today. Goodenough actually hasn't seen a dime from this. He signed away all the rights to the UK's Atomic Energy Research Establishment, or AIR. And then iron let Sony commercialize the battery and the British state took licensing fees from all the battery manufacturers until the patent ran out in 2002. Oh, just a quick little sign note. He was 56 years old when he did this work on lithium ion batteries. What did he do before this? He invented RAM. Yeah, like RAM, like the RAM in your computer, random access memory, the thing that makes your computer work. He was on the team that actually invented that. Seriously, legend. Now, for most people, inventing two different world-changing technologies and being showered with every single prestigious science award under the sun would be enough. That's for most people. But that's not good enough. John Goodenough is still working at his lab at the University of Texas at Austin, and at 97 years old, he and his team might be on the verge of a new breakthrough in battery technology, solid-state batteries. Now, like I was saying before, batteries work by passing ions from a cathode to an anode, and it's usually done through an electrolyte that's usually a liquid or a gel of some kind. But one of the biggest problems with lithium-ion batteries, especially if you charge it too fast, is that it can form dendrites, little crystalline structures that build up on the anodes that can eventually grow into the cathode, which can lead to things like this and this. Every improvement on lithium-ion batteries over the years has been about increasing the energy density while cutting down on dendrites. And the fact of the matter is, as our energy storage solutions get bigger for EVs, for homes, for commercial applications, we're going to be charging more energy, more fast, and these dendrites are going to become even more of a problem. So the breakthrough? Solid glass electrolytes. It was actually formulated by Goodenough's protege Maria Helena Braga, and together they worked to perfect the prototype. And Goodenough heaped praise on Braga's work with uncharacteristically emotional sentiment. She brought to me a remarkable glass she had prepared. Not only does her glass transport at room temperature alkali cations almost as fast as a liquid electrolyte, but it also contains a high dielectric constant indicative of the presence of electric dipoles. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. Now what it means, amongst other things, is that this solid electrolyte wouldn't form dendrites and would provide a longer lasting, safer operating battery. But that's not good enough. Another advantage is that these battery cells can be made with earth-friendly materials. Having glass electrolytes means you can use low-cost sodium instead of lithium. Sodium can be taken out of the ocean, which covers, you know, three-quarters of the world. Also, solid-state makes manufacturing easier and cheaper and more commercially viable. But that's not good enough. These new batteries would also last twice as long, if not longer, than regular batteries. In the lab, Goodenough's battery lasted 1,200 recycled charges and had the same amount of battery degradation as a normal lithium-ion battery has after 500 charges. But guess what? That's still not good enough! They would also be able to work at insane temperatures, everything from negative 20 degrees Celsius up to 60 degrees Celsius in lab tests. But of course, the big question here is storage. All that stuff is great, but it means nothing if it doesn't hold as much energy as previous batteries did. Well, this is where things finally start to get good enough, because according to their tests, these batteries hold 2.2 to 5 times as much energy as traditional lithium-ion batteries. This means a Model 3 could get up to 700 miles per charge. And that's on the low end. 1,000 miles is easily within the range of possibility. A lighter, more durable, cheaper to produce, more environmentally friendly battery that doubles the range of gas cars would be the end of the internal combustion engine. Full stop. This would be a game changer for the energy grid with smaller, easier to produce, utility level battery storage systems. A single pack the size of a shipping container could power an entire neighborhood and prevent blackouts. Going the other direction, size wise, our phones and our laptops could work for days without needing to be recharged. But when you get even smaller, things get even more interesting. Wearables like smart watches would become more robust, and even more game-changing, smart glasses with augmented reality might become a lot more available with stylish designs that people would actually want to wear. But maybe most important is the impact this could have on medical devices. One of the biggest hurdles for medical devices is keeping them small and lightweight so that people can go out and live their lives. From vitro surface patches to monitor vital signs, neurostimulators to fight Parkinson's, even drug delivery patches giving long-term medications to patients, especially the elderly. 
Prosthetic limbs will be lighter and more capable, and exoskeletons could be streamlined, allowing differently abled people to walk while not having to be encumbered by large heavy batteries. And lighter, more rugged battery powered devices would be a huge help to first responders who work in extreme conditions. Not to mention the wide uh, temperature range that these things work in would make them perfect for space exploration. The capabilities are seemingly endless. We're going to start to truly see some science fiction stuff become reality. Some of the companies working on this include Elika, who are working on medical devices like I mentioned a minute ago, but they're also working on aerospace applications. Meaning maybe just maybe electric airplanes? Maybe? Solid Power Works is innovating in the low Earth orbit satellites to perform mission critical tasks for research and military applications. Toyota is supposedly working on a solid state battery tech and it's rumored they'll be making a big announcement to coincide with the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And Tesla, of course, is racing to innovate on their batteries with the purchase of Hybar Systems and Maxwell Technologies in 2019. In fact, our friend Gally Russell over at HyperChange is speculating that possibly Tesla is working with good enough and his team to bring solid state batteries to Tesla's. Now, there's no uh, proof of this whatsoever. It's all speculation at this point, but he lays out his case in a video that I'll, I'll link up here. It's worth checking out. Now, all of this is super exciting, but of course it has to be said, success in the lab does not necessarily equal success in the marketplace. It's one thing to make a handful of prototypes in a lab, it's another thing to make millions and millions of them in the, you know, supply chains that go along with that in real life. Plus, there are many people who are skeptical of good enough claims, as they should be. There have been a lot of too-good-to-be-true battery announcements that have occurred out there that never really turned out to be anything. But there is one difference in this case that is worth mentioning. In the other cases, they weren't John B. Good enough. And this totally freaking is. Those other fly-by-night jabronis were not people who had played a part in one of the biggest game changers in technology over the last 50 years. John B. Goodenough did. Twice. You want credibility? Because that's how you get credibility. Now, like all new technologies, there's going to be a gestation period with solid-state batteries as they get proven out in the lab and in the real world before they actually make it out into the marketplace and into our devices and into our cars. Sony first released lithium-ion powered devices in 1991, a full 13 years after it was first developed in a lab. But battery technology is starting to become the next big gold rush, with everybody clamoring to be at the forefront of the next big breakthrough. This means billions and billions and billions of dollars are pouring into this because the company that comes out on top is going to be one of the most powerful companies in the world. And while it may take a while to hit the market, the adoption for new technologies is accelerating all the time, so I'm predicting maybe sometime around 2025 is when this starts to take over? I don't know, what do you think? Agree or disagree in the comments. And last but not least, I hope you'll join me in cheering on John B. Goodenough and Helena Braga and their entire team as they work to change the world once again. I don't want man in his greed to exploit the resources of Earth to turn what should be a garden into a desert. And, as I am fond of saying, good show, old chap. Now one thing I didn't even really touch on here is how these batteries could help store energy from renewable uh, sources, which is kind of one of their best use cases. I can't believe I didn't really talk about that. Regardless, if you want to learn more about renewable energy, one of the best places to go is the Solar Energy course on Brilliant.org. This course walks you through pretty much everything you could want to know about solar energy, from how photons are created in the sun, to how they travel to Earth, to how we can use that to create electricity and more. This is an all-encompassing course that will tell you everything you ever wanted to know about solar energy, but we're afraid to ask. Which, by the way, why are you so afraid to ask? Just ask. And this is just one of the always growing list of courses on Brilliant that can teach you by walking you through puzzles and games and allowing you to figure out the solutions on your own. Basically teaching you how to think like a scientist and apply that thinking to the rest of your life. Followers of this channel know I've been talking about Brilliant for a long time now and I'm telling you, it just, it just keeps getting better. It's like every time I get on there, I find something new and amazing that I didn't know about before. It's becoming more interactive, that the illustrations are better. It's just constantly improving. It's definitely something to check out. And they're even improving on existing courses, making them more interactive, making them downloadable so you can do it on the go with better graphics and illustrations, daily challenges. It's just an awesome program. And I'm pretty sure if you went through every single course on Brilliant, you would be some kind of super villain or something. So if you have any, you know, ambitions for world domination, well, there's never been a better time. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and get free access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers and whatnot. And if you sign up for their premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses, you can get 20% off of your subscription for life. It also makes a great gift. Just saying. So go check out brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links down below. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are supporting this channel, helping me build a team, just being awesome people. I can't thank you guys enough. There are some new people I want to shout out real quick. Let me murder their names. We got Mike Keeler, Brent Winger, Oliver Woe, Dave Wolf, 
Babinka, Leon Winderschoven, uh, Jan Jacobson, David W. Kudar, and Todd Odegaard. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, and just join an amazing group of people and make a lot of friends, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts are available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. They also make good gifts, and it's not just t-shirts. It's mugs, it's posters, hoodies, you name it. There's all kinds of cool, fun, nerdy stuff there. Go check it out, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Please like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, uh, check out this video. It's tailored just for you. And there's many others over here on the side that Google thinks you'll like. And if you do like them and you're not subscribed, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. And with that, I will let you get on with your regularly scheduled interneting. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening rest of the week. And I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.